Good morning. Welcome to the WOW class. I'm Jennifer Degler. I'm so glad that you're here and I'm excited to get to study God's Word with you today and just tell us where you're watching from in the comments. And I just want to say hello to all my, my WOW ladies. I sure do miss you. I can't believe this social distancing has been going on now for, um, gosh, what has it been over a month now? So, but I'm just so glad that we get to meet this way. Hey, Trudy, I'm glad that you're watching. I bet you're watching there with your sister. So um, if you <clears throat> would like to make um, comments and join in the class discussion, then when I ask uh, discussion questions, just type your answer there in the comment section and then I'll be able to read out some of your responses and um, it'll be like we're having class discussion. So good morning, Sherry, all the way out there in Texas. Good morning, Carla. Good morning, Kathy. Hey, Robin, I'm glad you're watching. Robin is a Calvary person, so we're glad you're here. Good morning, Nancy. Look, Robin and Nancy, you both are watching at the same time, my, my Trancy friends. Um, it's really good to see everybody. I'm excited that we're going to be in Romans. Before um, social distancing started in the month of March, we were beginning in the WOW class, a three-month study of the book of Romans. So I had already started teaching from Romans. And then when we went to social distancing, I decided, okay, I'm not going to teach from Romans. I'm going to just teach some things that have to do with fear and worry and um but I'm back in Romans, and so moving forward, we're going we're gonna to keep studying in Romans. Good morning, Lisa. Hey, Judy. Hey, Melissa. Hey, Dan Russell. I'm glad you're welcome to the WOW class. You get to come as a man to the WOW class, um, or maybe that's your, your beautiful bride watching. Good morning, Randy Lynn. Hey, Vicki. Hey, Cindy. Hey, Betty. Hey, Susie. We're glad that all of you are watching. So if you've got your Bible, if you would open it up to Romans 5, and we're going to just look at the first five verses. And um, hey, Donna, hey, Mary. And, you know, the chapter 5 starts off and it's really upbeat, which, which is great. Um, and if you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you have reasons to rejoice. And we're going to cover two of those reasons that you have to rejoice, even during a time like this where um, it's been a really hard time for our country and for the world over um, the last couple of months. And so um, we're going to look at two of those reasons today. And the first thing we're going to see is that believers can rejoice because, number one, you have peace with God. And number two, every problem has a purpose. So let's talk first about that first reason we have to rejoice, which is that you have peace with God. And here's our first discussion question. And if you would just write, uh, just type there in the comments section your answers to these to this question. I'm going to teach a little bit and then I'll come back and I'll read some of your responses. So here's the first discussion question. What do you think it means to have peace with God? What do you think it means to be at peace with God? And how does it benefit you to be at peace with God? What do you think it means to be at peace with God? And how does it benefit you? How does it benefit a person to be at peace with God? So just type your answer in there. Um, good morning, Amanda. Good morning, Jana. Hey, Leanne. Hey, Ashley. Good morning, Susan. Hey, Danielle. Hey, Paula. Good morning, Peggy. We're, I'm so glad that you're watching. Let me read for you Romans 5, the first two verses. And this is Paul writing to the Romans. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay, now there's a therefore. That passage starts off with therefore. So if you're reading the Bible and you come across a therefore, do you know what you're supposed to do next? I can hear the ladies in the wow class saying, you're supposed to say, what is that there for? Exactly. Which means you, you need to look back and see what, what was the author of this book just talking about. And the first three chapters of Romans, Paul is talking about our sin problem. He's saying that all of us are guilty of sin, that we're all separated from God, that our sin makes us God, God's enemies. 
And then in chapter four, he had, Paul says, here's your sin solution, that you can be made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. So the therefore is therefore, let's, let's look at uh, verse, uh, chapter four, verses 24 through 25 and see if this doesn't just describe the weekend that we just celebrated. Remember that? I know in, in some ways, don't you all feel like this? these weeks are like the longest weeks of your life? But yes, last weekend was Easter weekend. Let me read that for you, Romans 4, 24 through 25. But also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Therefore, therefore, since we have been justified, since we've been made right with God, just justification is one of those big fancy church words. It just means made just as if you'd never sinned. So therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Okay, so let me read some of your answers. What do you think it means to have peace with God and how does it benefit us to be at peace with God? So let me see what some good morning, sissy. Um, Kathy says, at peace with God is that I'm not responsible for the outcome. God has this. I'm responsible for my actions and my obedience to him. Yes, exactly. I'm, I'm looking back to see if we have any more discussion question, any more discussion answers. That was kind of a hard question, wasn't it? What does it mean to have peace with God? You know, peace with God is, is more than just a ceasefire. There, there are four nuances to peace with God. Number one, we no longer face God's divine wrath for our sins. That means on Judgment Day, there's going to be no wrath that we're going to have to face. And the second thing that peace with God means is that we're reunited with God in a loving relationship. That means we have fellowship with God. Now, fellowship is one of those words. I've never heard people outside the church really use the word fellowship. And I always think about when I was a kid, the, the room where the kitchen was, where we would have Wednesday night dinner at church was called the fellowship hall. And I remember thinking, you know, I've never been in another building outside of a church that had a fellowship hall. But that's what we have through Jesus Christ. We're able to have fellowship, that close, intimate relationship with God. The, a third aspect to having peace with God is that we can have unity and a loving relationship with other believers. Even if, as the whole body of believers, we don't agree on every little point, like how wet do you have to get when you get baptized? Um, but if we believe on the core, if we believe the core principles of the gospel, that Jesus Christ was that perfect sacrifice for our sins, and that he was buried, and then he was rose, that um, God raised him on the third day, and that he makes us right with God, then, then we, can, we, have, we can have that unity and loving relationship with other believers. And then the last aspect, and I want you to grab a hold of this, because this is something we need to be today. Because we have peace with God, we are empowered to be agents of peace in a strife-filled world. You get to be a peace agent here on earth. You get to be a peace agent on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on your street, at your workplace, assuming we ever get to return to our workplaces, in your church, in your family. You get to be an agent of peace. So peace of God is not just the absence of war. It's a real peace, a real peace. Okay, now our second discussion question, and I really want to hear from you all on this one. What advice do you have for someone who's really struggling with feeling accepted by God? They're really having trouble accepting God's grace. And this is somebody who just keeps doing more and more and more to make himself or make herself seem worthy to God. All right, so what advice would you have for somebody? They're just on that treadmill and they're really struggling 
to feel accepted by God. Regardless of what this says here, that Jesus Christ has done the work, they're really having trouble accepting that. So what advice would you have for someone? What wisdom do you have? What words do you have for someone who might be in that position? So look there in verse 2. It says, um, Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So the major reason for our peace with God is that we have obtained access through Him, through Jesus Christ, by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And so that word access that means we have freedom to regularly enter God's presence. And if you've been raised in church, it, that may not seem like such a big concept to you, but that was a staggering concept to the Jewish people in Paul's day. Because for them, access to God only came through the Holy of Holies in their temple. And that only happened once a year. And only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. So I want you to think about your favorite band, your favorite singer, and you really want to see them perform. And we're at a point where once again, we can have large group gatherings and you're able to purchase a ticket, but the only ticket you can get is that nosebleed. You are on the top row in the back of the stadium and they're gonna just look like a little tiny ant. And so your ticket comes, your ticket arrives, but instead of that nosebleed ticket, where you are so far away, you get an all-access backstage pass. Plus, you get to have dinner with your favorite singer or your favorite band. It's just you and the band. Woohoo! Well, you see, Jesus is your all-access pass to the throne room of God. You can be in a peaceful, loving, intimate relationship with God because of Jesus' Easter weekend sacrifice. Um, in the New Living Translation, it puts verse 2 this way. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. Um, one of my favorite verses is Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Isn't that a wonderful promise that we can boldly come into God's throne room confident that we're going to receive grace? Um, and that, that word access, that the Greek word, um, now here we go. Let's see if I can pronounce this right. It's prosagoge, prosagoge. And, and there's two great word pictures that go with this. One means to usher into the presence of royalty. And the other word picture is to steer into a harbor, to steer into a haven. So it's this idea that Jesus gives us access and he ushers us into the presence of royalty. Now, I want you to imagine that you have an opportunity to meet Queen Elizabeth. So Queen Elizabeth is on her throne and you're outside in the, in the outside waiting and you're going to be ushered in by a footman into the presence of Queen Elizabeth. Now, how do you think Queen Elizabeth is going to greet you? Well, it's not going to be a high five. I can tell you that. It's probably going to be very restrained, very formal. She's going to give you a very careful handshake. Well, because of Jesus' sacrifice and completed work on Calvary and by your faith, you are ushered into God's throne room, and God is thrilled to see you. God smiles when you draw near, and you receive grace, not condemnation, not judgment, not punishment, not the cold shoulder, not the silent treatment, not that limp kind of handshake. You receive the incredible, undeserved kindness of God. That's an important note for us. Because of Jesus Christ, you will never wear out your welcome with God. You will always receive a warm welcome from God because of the work of Jesus Christ. So uh, let's apply that to our lives. Do you regularly draw near to your father, the King of Kings? 
Or are you relating to God like he is someone other than who he says he is? Sometimes we relate to God like he's not God. We relate to him like maybe he's our earthly father or our earthly mother or someone else who did not receive us the way that God wants to receive us. So regardless of how someone significant has treated you here on earth, and regardless of how you react to you, God reacts with delight when you draw near because of the work of Jesus Christ. And then the other picture, that other word picture for access was to steer into a harbor, to steer into a safe haven. It's like this, here we go with my very fancy artwork, okay? So it's like, here's, here's the harbor and out here, are, are the waves. Out here is where the water is dangerous. And then, but if you can steer into this harbor, there's the dock, um, then it's safe in here. And so Jesus Christ, he, he gives us access into this safe harbor. And so for many of us, it is like we're out here struggling and, and we want to be in this safe harbor and we're trying on our own efforts to get right with God. We want to be in this place where we feel God's love, where we feel his presence and his acceptance and love. But we're just still out here struggling like it's all up to us. Like Jesus hasn't done enough to usher us in here. And we're just trying, we're doing more and more and more. But because of Jesus' completed work, we do reach the harbor of God's grace, that peaceful haven of His grace. It's this calm place of depending on, on what God has already done for us instead of depending on what we can do for ourselves, that struggle. So there's a note for us. Steer your insecure, your doubt-filled, your anxious thoughts towards the safe haven of God's grace. Steer them that way. Quit struggling out here. And, and that's why I had that discussion question. I'm getting ready to read your responses to that. You know, what advice do you have for someone who's stuck out here and they're just struggling so hard and they, they can't seem to accept that, that Jesus has done that work for them and ushers them in to that safe harbor. So let me read some of your things that, that you've said. Um, let's see. Peggy says, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, His grace is a gift. Gifts are given, not purchased or earned. Yes, Peggy, we have to keep reminding ourselves it is a gift. Melissa says, tell them about how God has worked in our lives forgiving us. Yes, Melissa, you know, your own story is something people can't argue with because it's your story. And so we, oftentimes as we talk about maybe how we've struggled with that at times and how we overcame that and could fully accept that. Amanda says, I actually had been meeting with a coworker about this, how she's struggling. And a lot of hers comes from hurt of past circumstances. We've talked about forgiveness with what had happened. Good for you, Amanda. Yeah, so many times again, we're, we're having trouble accepting God's grace, oftentimes because we didn't experience that in our human relationships. And so it's hard to imagine that God could be different, and yet He is. Um, hey, Beth, happy anniversary. Beth and Kevin, 34 years. Um, let's see what else other people have said here. Emily says, Ask them how good they think they have to be in order to achieve acceptance from God. Explain that with God's grace, that weight of perfection can be lifted, that they will never be able to reach perfection no matter how hard that is to hear. Yes, you know, we think perfection is going to feel so good when we get there, but because it's just not possible here on earth for us to reach that level of perfection, but knowing that's already been done for us. It's a huge weight lifted when we can let go, get off that hamster wheel of just trying, trying, trying. Good morning, Angie. Hi, Paul. Hey, Karen. We're glad that you're watching. Yes. So realizing even if you have been a believer for a long time, and it, it, you can still find yourself at times feeling like, okay, I, I just have got to keep doing more. 
so that the Lord will keep loving me, that the, the Lord will keep welcoming me into his throne room when that's already been done for you through, through Jesus Christ. So believers can rejoice because you have peace with God. And then second, believers can rejoice because every problem has a purpose. And aren't you glad to hear that? given everything that we've been through. And so here's our, um, our final discussion question. What are you not in control of right now? And how could that suffering make you more spiritually mature? What are you struggling with right now? What is hard for you? What are you suffering from right now? Things you're not in control of. And how could that suffering that you're going through right now, how could that make you more spiritually mature? If suffering is whenever we're not in control, I would say there are a lot of things right now over the last um, month, month and a half that we are not in control of. So what are, what's troubling you this morning and how could that suffering over time make you more spiritually mature. So you post your answers to that and then I'm gonna teach and then I'll go back and read some of your answers. I'm, I'm really eager to hear what you have to say to that this morning. So let me read for you Romans 5 verses 3 through 5. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Now I have to tell you, when I read this passage, I'm tracking right with Paul through verses one and two. And he's saying, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God at the end of verse two. And I'm like, that's lovely, Paul. I'm going to cross stitch that on a pillow. We rejoice, yes, in the hope of the glory of God. And then he goes on to verse three. And not only that, but we rejoice in our afflictions. What? What, what Paul? What, what? I am not cross stitching that on a pillow. Now listen, Paul is not saying that we should enjoy our sufferings. But he is also not saying that suffering always produces endurance, that suffering always produces strong character and spiritual maturity, that suffering always produces confident hope. He's not saying that. Suffering produces bitterness and spiritual rot in some of us. It's, it's like the saying, time heals all wounds. That is not true. It, time doesn't heal all wounds. It's what you do during all that time that leads to healing. So there's an important note for us there. When you're suffering, like what we've all been going through, carefully choose your thoughts and your actions because they predict how you're going to come out of this. Are you going to come out better or are you going to come out bitter? Are you going to come out hopeful or hopeless? Are you going to be somebody who shines in a crisis or whines in a crisis? Are you going to come out of this or anything else that you may be suffering from? I know some of you before all of this COVID-19 situation, you were already suffering. Maybe it's something with your health. Maybe it's something in a relationship. Maybe you were already financially really shaky. Maybe you'd already lost your job. It, so many things that you maybe have been already suffering with. And so we have to carefully choose our thoughts and our actions so that we come out of whatever suffering we experience more like Jesus instead of more like our worst self. You know, in verses three and four, it uses the word endurance. And, and in Greek, that, that word means more than just like passively enduring something where you're just like, all right, I'm just, oh, I'm just gonna be here. I'm just gonna endure this. That is not what that word means. Um, the, the Greek word is hupomene, hupomene. And it means a spirit that overcomes the world. It means to actively overcome and persevere through the trials of life. 
It's being a conqueror instead of a complainer. And please hear me, I'm not saying that when we're suffering that we should just never say a word about it and carry all of that on the inside. I am not saying that. In last week's lesson, we talked about how important it is to pour out before the Lord when we've had a loss, to pour that out before Him so that He can bring light and air and healing in there. I am saying, as suffering goes on and on, that we carefully choose our words and actions because they will predict how we look when we come out of this. And when you meet trials and problems with hupomene, with that kind of endurance, with grit, with fortitude, with a cheerful endurance and a steadfast faith, you know, when you're choosing, you're making this choice, I'm going to have thoughts and words and actions that reflect this, then you're going to develop strength of character and you will emerge from your suffering a stronger, better, more hopeful follower of Christ. Now the problem situation, the crisis did not change. It's still unwelcome, it's still unpleasant, but you changed for the better. So you can rejoice. That's why Paul says, rejoice. There was a purpose in your problem situation. I'm not saying that the Lord made COVID-19 happen so that you would develop your character. That's not at all what I'm saying. That, I, that happened because we live in a fallen world. Um, God hates death. His original plan was not for us to ever die. But now that this has happened in our broken world, there is a purpose in our problem situation. I was reading this Richard, Richard Rohr devotional this week, and he was saying, suffering allows us the ability to change because suffering makes us give up the illusion of being in control and give that control back to God. Suffering allows us to grow emotionally and spiritually stronger instead of just hoping that things will go back to the way they used to be. Okay, so let me read your, what your thoughts, you know, what are you not of in, what are you not in control of right now? What troubles and trials are you facing? And how could that suffering make you more spiritually mature? How could that give you that strength of character? Oh, good. You all are answering on this one. You all have been quiet thus far this week. Amanda says, we pretty much are not in control of anything right now at all. Where can we go? When can we go? The suffering can help us realize that we need to, what we need to work on spiritually. Yes, it can. Gloria says, I think the suffering we're going through is one of God's ways of building unity of his world. Gloria, hasn't it been exciting to see how believers have come together and are, are unifying to be agents of peace and help? Um, we get to be Jesus with hands and feet, with Jesus with skin on during a time like this, to get outside our brick buildings and be the church, to be unified in that. That is really an exciting thing. Inez says, losing control of the day-to-day -day because of homeschooling and ADHD spectrum grandson has revealed the time and spiritual influence I get to have in his life. It's a precious time. Oh, Inez, that is very dear, yes. Um, and you're just getting to have that time with him that you would not have had before. And he will be blessed. Anybody's blessed by time with you, Inez. Danielle says, I am not in control of a whole lot of things right now. Ha, huh, I can't even just say one thing, but in times when the future is uncertain, I find I run to Jesus in a different way. Throwing my burdens and concerns on Jesus over and over deepens my relationship with him and helps me to strengthen my faith in the future. I can look back and remember God's faithfulness and it helps me through future challenges. Boy, that is so true, Danielle, that it just, my relationship with the Lord has felt there's a different quality to it the more out of control I feel of my circumstances and the bigger God seems and the smaller that I seem. And I think that that is a, um, a good perspective shift that needs to happen. Susan says, the recent loss of her job, yes, being out of control of that, depending on God for direction and what path he will lead me next. She's staying in his word and communicating with him daily throughout the day, knowing that God is in control. He is, and he's, he's going to bring you another job, Susan. I don't know when, and I don't know what it will be, but they will be blessed. 
um, to get to hire you, Susan. Carlin says, my mind is always worrying about something, but God reminds me to be still and know I am God and give your trouble to me and trust me and you'll be okay. It reminds me of all the good I've had, my health, my great husband that loves me and a good job and helping other people in prayer. Yes. God will do that. When we, when we do go to him, we go into that safe haven. Then he can remind us of what he has done for us. And that does help us to endure. Thank you for sharing that, Carlin. Julia says, there are so many things out of my control. Yes, Julia is in her first year of teaching, um, but especially how other people are acting, what they're doing during this time so we can get back to normal. I am not in charge of others. God is. I'm so thankful for that because he holds all the control. Yes, Julia, he does. And boy, we are not in control of other people. Sometimes we're barely in control of ourselves. Um, Lisa says, I am not in control of my future, regardless of how much I try to arrange everything in my life. God is the headmaster. My future is not a mystery to him. He lives in the future. He's already there, Lisa, working out things for us. God knows what's best for me and wants to bless me when I trust him and I seek him. Absolutely. Um, Amanda says, why does it take this, though, for us to realize these things? You know, um, I think it does take us to slowing down. And truly, um, suffering breaks that illusion that we are in control. And I don't know about you, but I, I seem to spend a lot of my time and energy trying to reinforce the belief that I am in control. And so suffering, whether it's suffering from a health issue, whether it's suffering from a financial issue or suffering because we're out of control of, of, of even whether we can meet together um, at this time, that all of those remind us who is in control and that he is a good and a loving father. Thank you for sharing all of that. So isn't it exciting to see every problem has a purpose? and that you can have peace with God. Those are two wonderful reasons to rejoice as a believer in Jesus Christ. In the midst of all of this, to remind yourself, I am at peace with God. Um, and there in verse five, where it says, for we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. You are dearly, dearly loved by the Lord. And if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are at peace with God. And he does invite you, come into that safe harbor with me. All that struggle, all that when you get on the Internet and you're reading all that stuff about the coronavirus, just put that down. Just come into that safe harbor with me. He welcomes you into his throne room. You'll never wear out your welcome with God. He just invites you. If, you're really, if you've really been struggling... He invites you, come on, get, get right up on my lap. Maybe you just need to lay your head right there against the Lord's chest and let him just hold you and comfort you and remind you, I dearly love you. I dearly love you as my child, my daughter, my son, and I'm going to take care of you in this. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this bright spot um, in the book of Romans. Romans can be a heavy book at times, but we just thank you for this. We thank you for Paul's excitement that we are at peace with you, Lord, because of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, how this Paul gives us this hard teaching that we can rejoice even in our sufferings. We do thank you, Lord, that you have a purpose in every problem. And Lord, would you show us, would you remind us of what those purposes are it just helps us have meaning in, during a time that we can wonder what is the meaning of all of this. We thank you for technology. Lord, I ask that if there's anyone watching that doesn't yet have a relationship with you, that, Lord, they would pray even now to receive you, um, to be forgiven of their sins, and to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your word. In your name we pray. Amen. So if you don't have a church service that you're going to go to, I invite you to join me at 11 a.m. on a manual service. You can go to ibclex.com um, IBC slash online. It's also on YouTube. Um, I, let's see, I think it's on Roku, live streaming. Um, but uh, let's see, we were at 9.30, 11, again at 1 p.m., 
Um, you can also, if you like to watch TV on WLEX 18, it'll be broadcast live at 11 a.m. If you need help, um, or if you know someone who has a need during this COVID crisis, you can go to ibclex.com slash help, and there's an online form that you can fill out um, if you need some help. Um, and if you would like to help in some way, you can go to ibclex.com slash be the church, and you can get more information on how you can help with Emmanuel's response. And I wanna challenge the wow ladies. One of the thing, things that Emmanuel's asking us to do is next Sunday between noon and 5 p.m. to come to door number 10, which is the door we used to go in to go to the wow class. It's the one under the canopy that you drive under at the back of Emmanuel and bring donated food items. And in your WOW email, there's a list of that. It's things like canned soup, um, ramen noodles, um, different things. You can, you can find that list on IBC's website or in your email. So WOW class, um, if you can go to the grocery this week, if you're getting out, get some of those items. Let's show up. Let's bring a lot of things to donate for people that are in need this week. So it was so good to be with you. Um, Hello, Dana. Hello, Lisa. Oh, Dana's watching all the way there in Kansas City. It's good to see you, Dana. Um, hey, Marie. Um, hey, Angie. Hey, Nancy. Hey, Gloria. It's great to be with you all. I love you all. If I can pray for you in any way, please let me know. And it was great to be with you. Bye-bye.